The meeting will come to order. The Strategic Forces Subcommittee meets today to review the fiscal year 2025 budget request for national security space programs. Good afternoon to our witnesses, Dr. Plum, Mr. Cavelli, Dr. Mink, and Ms. Wilkerson. Thank you all for being here and thank you for your service to our country. Today is Dr. Plum's last appearance before this subcommittee and maybe even his last public appearance as the first Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. We thank you for your service. I want to thank you for your efforts over the years to normalize the way the department handles the space domain. Your work on the space strategic review and space classification guidance will serve as policy foundation for those who succeed you. As you stated in your space policy review last year, our national security space posture considers, quote, space as a distinct operational domain of national military power, unquote. Now, long ago, our adversaries determined that space is vital to the joint forces operation, and they have spent the last several years developing counter space weapons to threaten our troops. Both China and Russia have weaponized space, and we must catch up to contend with this new reality. Unfortunately, our governance structures present many hurdles to maintaining space superiority. We have redefined the space domain from a support function to a distinct operational domain, and the policies and directives that underpin who does what have not kept pace. Many of these internal documents were last updated a decade ago. A decade ago, we didn't have a space force, and SpaceX hadn't yet demonstrated a first stage landing. Technology and how we think about space has grown by leaps and bounds since then. For example, I am concerned about how we get space-based information into the hands of the warfighters on a tactically relevant timeline. Given the retirement of the JSTARS platform beginning in the mid-2020s, the department decided in the fiscal year 23 budget request to transition ground-moving target indication, GMTI, from an air platform to a space-based capability. Since the NRO is procuring this new system, does that mean NGA should serve its traditional role as clearinghouse for joint force request of scarce national assets? Or as you, Mr. Cavelli, have argued, is this a purely Title X mission that needs to be tasked, owned, and operated by the Department of Defense? This is not a trivial bureaucratic turf war. What we decide here will set the pattern for how we handle the transition to space from other previously air-based missions. It won't surprise anyone to hear that this committee believes that the GMTI mission and any future systems to follow must be tasked and controlled by the Department of Defense. Last year's bill established the Moving Target Indication Working Group, co-chaired by the Space Force and the Joint Staff. So I look forward to hearing all of your perspectives on this esoteric but essential issue. Further, many of the technological advancements that are driving us to shift these missions to space are being developed by a cutting-edge commercial space industry. We now have companies that want to provide not only launch services and communications, but imagery and rendezvous and proximity operations. This committee has long been a proponent of taking as much advantage of these commercial capabilities as possible. I was glad to see your office, Dr. Plum, and the Space Force released strategies to take advantage of these commercial developments last month. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how they are thinking about these commercial capabilities and specifically how they plan to integrate them with the existing government architecture. In a world of limited budgets, it will become even more critical for the entire national security space enterprise to figure out how they leverage these commercial companies to improve. I now recognize Ranking Member Moulton for his opening comments. Thank you, Chairman Lamborn, and, and welcome to our panel of witnesses. Uh, before I begin my remarks, I also want to comment on Dr. Plum. I was a little worried you were going to say it's his last public appearance, appearance ever, and we certainly hope that's not the case because you've been an amazing public servant, and we've been very, very lucky to have you. I personally have learned a lot from you, and I was personally disappointed when you said you were going to leave, although you have every right to do what's right for your family. Um, but we will miss you. Um, you have helped turn around the space enterprise. I'm very confident with our course right now. Uh, I wasn't confident five years ago, and you've been a huge part of making that, that change. So, so thank you so much for, for your service. Our national security space architecture is undergoing a significant transformation. 
a transformation necessary because everyday American life is deeply reliant on space. The global positioning system, GPS, probably helped everyone in this room get somewhere today. And it also provides necessary timing information to nearly every banking and financial system worldwide. And it is no secret that most weapon systems in the Department of Defense inventory require a GPS signal as well. In part because of this over-reliance, our adversaries have been developing, deploying, and demonstrating capabilities in space and on Earth to deny, degrade, and destroy U.S. satellites. In just the past two years, the People's Republic of China has almost doubled their number of satellites on orbit to 400, with plans for nearly 1,000 by 2030. And they include capabilities with inherently offensive applications. And as we all know <clears throat> now, due to what was essentially an intelligence leak from Congress, Russia is developing a nuclear weapon in space. If launched, it would be in direct violation of the Outer Space Treaty, and if detonated, it would degrade or destroy nearly every satellite in its path. These advancements by our adversaries have required a transformation to a more proliferated, resilient, and protected U.S. architecture. In addition, the U.S. commercial market has exploded in the past five years. SpaceX is probably best known, but there are companies outpacing DOD and in innovation across the board, whether that be in satellite communications, remote sensing, space domain awareness, or in developing capabilities to defend and protect our existing exquisite satellites on orbit today. While this subcommittee has been pushing both the DOD and intelligence community to fully embrace commercial capabilities, that culture shift has been met with considerable resistance. That is why I'm very encouraged by the release of both the DOD and Space Force commercial space strategies. It's not enough to simply award contracts. We must have a plan to fully integrate these innovative capabilities into government systems to help reinforce our national advantage in space. We also continue to make significant progress with our incredible network of allies and partners. The U.S. must continue to lead by example on establishing norms of behavior for responsible operations in space. Not to diminish this progress overall, there are some areas we should continue to watch closely. In addition to the pattern of large satellite programs being late and over budget, the ground system architecture still frequently comes as an afterthought. We've been notified yet again of delays of the next generation operational ground control segment, the modern cyber secure ground system to operate GPS satellites. OCX was supposed to be delivered in 2016 for $3.9 billion. Now, eight years later, and at almost double that cost, we are still waiting. Unfortunately, OCX is the most egregious case, but others such as Atlas are also experiencing delays in cost overruns. Mr. Cavelli, I would like to understand how you are addressing these issues holistically across the Space Force. Another area this subcommittee must watch is something the chairman mentioned, the jurisdictional divide between traditional space-based intelligence collection versus DOD's use of the domain for tactical applications. The latter is somewhat a new phenomenon. Tactical missions like surveillance of ground targets are now moving from land, sea, or air platforms into orbit. We must be sure that government policy does not assume that all space assets are formal intelligence or Title 50 assets, or we may, or we may accidentally block our combatant commanders from getting targeting information quickly enough to use it, or block the services from fully taking advantage of commercial imaging and sensing. Space is a fascinating and infinite domain. Until recently, we only really experienced it through the lens of science fiction. But in reality, space has been a part of our daily lives as Americans since the dawn of the space race, and our adversaries are keenly aware of that. Our warfighters everywhere, on the ground, under the sea, and in the air, depend on space. The global dependence on space often means relying on American satellites. We must keep them secure, not only against the threats we see today, but against what we will face in the years and decades to come. I look forward to today's, to today's discussion with our witnesses on how best to maintain U.S. superiority in space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We now turn to our witnesses. Your prepared statements will be made part of the record. And it's doubtful that we'll be able to have the time to have a closed session because we do have votes in about 50 minutes. So we'll have time, though, to have a round of questions from ourselves as members of the committee and then um, go from there. I would ask that you all keep your statements to four minutes or less rather than five, just for the sake of time. Dr. Plum, you're recognized. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Moulton. Distinguished members of the committee, I uh, appreciate this chance to testify uh, one last time here, and this on the 25 space budget for the department. Uh, this is my last time uh, testifying, hopefully not my last public appearance, sir. Uh, 
I, I will be departing uh, later this month, but it has been a true privilege to serve, and I have uh, been heartened by the bipartisan approach this committee has taken to space uh, and to defense issues in particular, and I, uh, uh, I will say again, I've told you both personally, but, but thank you. It means a lot and I, to the country, and I think one of the reasons we've been able to move forward so much is because of, of that bipartisan approach, so I deeply appreciate it. Uh, we're clearly in a time of rapid change in the space strategic environment and it does not favor those who are slow or resistant to change. China and Russia are both rapidly fielding space and counter space capabilities to hold the joint force at risk and to deny us the space-based services that we rely on. The scale and scope of these threats <laughs> presents significant risks to the American people, to our national interests, and to our allies and partners. The President's uh, fiscal year 25 budget requests $33.7 billion for space to help meet these challenges. Some of these critical investments include $2.4 billion for National Security Space Launch, $1.5 billion for more resilient position navigation and timing, PNT, $4.2 billion for more resilient and protected SATCOM, as well as the Space Development Agency's proliferated low Earth orbit transport layer, $4.7 billion to develop new missile warning missile tracking architectures, and then $12.3 billion for a range of other capabilities to increase resiliency of our existing architectures and to protect our interests in space during competition, in crisis, and in conflict. Now, in addition to these investments, I just wanted to touch on the significant progress we've made over the last two years on what has become four key strategy and policy priorities. I've detailed those in length in my written testimony, but space control, space cooperation, space classification, and commercial space integration. We have obtained presidential guidance to assure our space missions and protect and defend the joint force from space-enabled attacks. We have greatly expanded our space cooperation with allies and partners, charting a path towards true combined operations in space that will strengthen collective deterrence. We have overhauled the department's space classification policy to remove unnecessary barriers to information flow throughout the joint force, barriers with our industry partners, and frankly, just barriers uh, within the department alone. We have released the first ever DOD commercial space integration strategy to harness the sector's incredible innovation to enhance our resilience. Going forward, the department will continue to press on all four lines of effort. I believe the progress we have made and the foundation we have laid here will pay dividends for years to come. So uh, in closing and aware of the time, just thank you again to the committee for your partnership and your tireless dedication to the department and our service members. And I look forward to this hearing and to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Cavelli. You're recognized. Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. With the growing threats in space, we must continue to transform our space architecture to be more proliferated, more resilient, so that space can be always counted on during times of peace, crisis, or conflict. As the Service Acquisition Executive for Space, I am focused on driving speed into acquisitions and delivering programs on cost and schedule. I'd like to highlight some of the progress we've made in the past year since I, I last testified. Since the spring of 2023, the Space Development Agency has delivered 27 satellites to orbit, nearly all of them in around three years from contract award to launch. This includes eight new missile warning, missile tracking satellites and 19 data transport satellites, and SDA recently demonstrated the first ever Link 16 network connection from space. The Space Rapid Capabilities Office completed and is in the process of fielding the first 11 of 24 low-cost transportable terrestrial satellite jammers, terrestrial satellite communications jammers. These jammers went from contract award to fielding in about 18 months. Meanwhile, Space System Command continues to make excellent progress modernizing both our missile warning and MILSATCOM architectures to be more resilient. Just a few weeks ago, Space Systems Command launched the first weather system follow-on microwave satellite to support the pivot to a more resilient, disaggregated hybrid weather architecture to meet warfighter needs. Last September, SSC Tactically Responsive Space Mission, Victus Knox, demonstrated the ability to go from factory floor to on-orbit operations in around five days. And since last April, there have been seven national security space launches that delivered critical warfighting capabilities to orbit. In addition, we continue to take advantage of a strong space industrial base including awarding contracts to non-traditional space companies and implementing our recently published commercial space strategy. Simultaneously, we are aggressively tackling challenging programs to get them over the finish line. We are focused and on delivering the GPS Next Generation Operational Control Segment, also known as OCX, and we are making progress towards getting the system ready to transition operations in 2025. 
Another one of our challenging programs that was mentioned was Atlas. We've made significant progress since we broke it up into more manageable deliverables. The program is on schedule to incrementally deliver space domain awareness command and control capabilities next year to enable the decommissioning of SPADOC. We've also proven we can build small satellites quickly. However, as we begin to deliver the next tranche of STA satellites this fall, getting the military services to adopt and use these satellites will be key. Doesn't matter how fast we build them if no one uses them. Likewise, our ability to maintain assured access to space for our space capabilities remains paramount and launch providers must be ready to scale and meet the increasing demand. Finally, we are working to move programs out of special access program stovepipes, thanks to John and, and his space classification policy update in December. This will improve our ability to integrate space to support other domains and enable better sharing with our allies. As we continue to drive speed into our acquisitions, our job and our top priority needs to stay focused on delivering programs on cost and schedule. We're going to do this by first ensuring that our acquisition strategies and requests for proposal documents are realistic and executable, by implementing a source selection strategy that leads to awarding contracts with achievable cost and schedule baselines. There's no better way to deliver on schedule than actually getting it right up front. And then once under contract, proactively managing the program to deliver that system that works and deliver it on cost and on schedule. Given the threats and the increased capabilities of our competitors, it is critical that we remain focused on delivering programs on cost and schedule. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Mink, you're recognized. Uh, Chairman Lamborn, uh, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished uh, members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be here today before you. Uh, and it is also a pleasure to represent the people of the National Reconnaissance Office. For more than 60 years, the NRO has been developing tools and techniques that advance our national security. Today, we're building on a legacy to innovate and make the United States even safer and stronger. Space-based intelligence has become a primary, if not the primary, means of collection in denied areas. This is especially critical as our competitors are seeking to deny our strategic advantage in space. With Congress's support and with the continued innovation at the NRO, we will ensure America retains its strategic advantage in space. Our FY25 budget request aims to keep the United States a world leader in space-based intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. It prioritizes investments in a diverse and resilient constellation to meet the needs of the warfighter intelligence community and our allies. We are committed to using taxpayer dollars effectively and efficiently. I'm proud to report that the NRO has, a, has just received the 15th consecutive clean audit for fiscal year 2023. Our effectiveness and efficiencies are really a result of the Title 10 and Title 50 authorities that we have, as NRO is both a defense intel part of the defense intelligence enterprise and the intelligence community. Our investments in tools, technologies, both on the ground and on orbit, ensure our customers get the information they need, where they need it, faster than ever before. With the support of Congress, the NRO will continue to invest in government-engineered and industry-built satellites that are resilient by design, in, in, in increasing partnerships that allow us to maximize our impact and developing the world's most advanced tools, information technology, and communication networks, again, allowing us to fuse critical data and deliver it to our customers any place on Earth. Over the next decade, the NRO will continue to increase the number of satellites, both large and small, operating across multiple orbits. Later this month, around the 19th, the first phase of our proliferated architecture is scheduled to launch as NRO L146 out of Vandenberg. We have already launched a number of demonstrations over the last few years to verify cost and performance, really to be comfortable and make sure we knew what we were doing. These systems will increase timeliness of access, diversify communication pathways, and enhance our resilience significantly. For our other ground systems and our on-orbit capabilities, we are strengthening our cyber defense, our cyber defense, eliminating single points of failure, and hardening our architecture. This will also enable a much more resilient system going forward. The NRO has been at the forefront of innovation since our inception, and today that culture of innovation is even more critical. Our highly skilled workforce, including both military and civilians, brings diverse viewpoints and innovative ideas to solve complex intelligence problems. Uh, a critical example is growing our workforce to be able to take full advantage of both AI, ML, machine learning, and automation that's going to be required to operate and deliver capability to the users. Partnerships are inherent in who we are. Our workforce is a blend of government, civilian, and members of every military service, primarily the Space Force, but every military service. 
As we evolve to meet the changing mission needs, we look forward to continued collaboration on personnel support from our, both our civilian and military partners. We maximize our partnership when we have partners and colleagues across the intelligence and defense community to leverage every possible innovative to optimize collection tools and effectiveness. For example, our partnership with U.S. Space Force and previously the Air Force on launch procurement has provided assured access to space for the NRO systems for over 15 years. We're fully committed to NSSL Phase 3 and have worked very closely with the Space Force to include all the capabilities that we need to execute our mission. Our continued success depends on our ability to adopt and to innovate faster, not only fast, but faster than any of our potential competitors, and on Congress's continued support for our mission. New technology, new partnerships, and the talents of our workforce are critical to maintaining our competitive advantage and keeping America safe. On behalf of the entire NRO workforce, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you here today. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Wilkerson, you're recognized. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the subcommittee. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is our nation's leading authority for geospatial intelligence, or GEOINT, providing warfighters, policymakers, intelligence professionals, and first responders with the decision advantage they need to carry out national security objectives at home and abroad from seabed to space. The GEOINT we deliver, much of which comes from space-based systems, conveys not only what when and where events are happening. It also illustrates how they are occurring, the implications, and what is likely to transpire next. NGA's GEOINT professionals work across more than 100 locations in the United States and around the world. Dual-headed as an intelligence agency and combat support agency, NGA provides GEOINT to the services, combatant commands, and other federal departments and agencies. This includes tasking, analysis, and dissemination of national technical means and commercial imagery, data, and geoint geo analytic services in support of community requirements. NGA is committed to maximizing efficient and effective use of all available geoint sensors, including those that are space-based, enabling collection to be at the right location at the right time to meet service and combatant command needs. Obtaining the data used to produce GEOINT is not a simple task. NGA's highly skilled intelligence collection professionals execute a process we call informed collection orchestration to align national priorities with operational and analytical needs and real world deadlines. NGA's unique ability to carry out informed collection orchestration is not only in statute, policy, and practice, it is rooted in our expertise as leaders in the GEOINT discipline. It is also central to ensuring that our warfighters and intelligence professionals alike receive the imagery and analysis they need when they need it. We continue to provide what is needed when it is needed by integrating with warfighting headquarters around the world to incorporate artificial intelligence through programs like MAVEN, accelerating their operations and decision speeds. As we move forward with AI, our goal is safe, responsible and accurate application of its capabilities in a way that augments and enhances our GEOINT workforce. I would also like to highlight two areas where NGA is leading within the space domain. First, we maintain detailed physical characterizations of our planet from the ocean floor to space, providing critical data and production of materials necessary for the safe navigation of air, land, and sea. Second, NGA also leads the way in guaranteeing assured precision and accuracy of GPS, maintaining the World Geodetic System 1984 or WGS 84 reference frame, which is the backbone for all geolocation. This foundational mission complements the important work we do to deliver GEOINT that advances national security priorities. NGA continues to ensure the security of space, because just as the United States recognizes the critical role of space, so too do our global competitors. Our most capable and potential adversaries continue to invest in increasingly threatening counterspace systems, intent on disrupting or denying critical space systems and services that not only support our national security, but also our everyday lives. 
NGA remains focused on understanding such capabilities and providing our warfighters and policymakers the information they require to counter and deter threats to our national and commercial assets. In closing, NGA relies greatly on data obtained from space systems to deliver vital GEOINT that advances national security priorities and the security of space. And we are committed to the partnerships with the United States Space Force, U.S. Space Command, and NRO to ensure that GEOINT plays the broadest role possible in understanding adversary space and counter space threats. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. We'll now begin our members' questions. We'll each have five minutes. I have a question for each one of you, so I'll ask for a concise answer. Uh, Dr. Plum, in your commercial space integration strategy, you talk about the possible need for commercial insurance, commercial war risk insurance, U.S. government provided insurance, and indemnification to be provided for commercial space providers as part of doing business with the U.S. government. Can you talk a little bit more about what authorities you think you will need to fully realize this? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The commercial space integration strategy, this is one of the main pieces uh, that was helping drive some of the, 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 the writing of this strategy because a lot of questions from industry on that and we were trying to lay flat what the actual situation is. I will say uh, for the air domain and for the maritime domain, there is a government-backed war risk insurance uh, vehicle, which is, you know, we know what it is, CRAF, uh, you've heard of CRAF perhaps uh, for the air domain, that's really just for air logistics. Uh, and then there's also the visa uh, for VISA, which is for the maritime. There is no similar uh, statutory authority for the space domain. Now, the department's not ready to say that we need that right now, uh, but the, de the secretary has tasked his department to go look and say, hey, what would be those conditions where we might need it? And part of that, of course, is where would that need to be changed in statute? All of those cases, uh, those types of insurance vehicles are only turned on when the department wants them. They're not a blanket agreement. It's only in specific situations the department agrees that in this specific case we should use them. So I think there's, there's goodness there, and I think uh, we would need Congress's help to do that if that was the direction we had to go. Okay, thank you. Ms. Wilkerson, I wanted to give you a chance to give NGA's perspective when it comes to the future of tasking for GMTI that we talked about earlier. From your vantage point, what policy documents or directives do you believe support your position? Thank you for the question. Um, sir, we, we really look forward to collaborating. Thank you for the question. Sir, we look forward to collaborating with our partners within Salesforce as well as the NRO in a way that allows for the, um, the leveraging of the expertise and skills that are resident in each of our agencies. We also anticipate that we will be a supporting, have a supporting role in the MTI working group. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mink, what, one issue that we hear a lot about is how much we are taking advantage of the commercial market for space imagery. What steps is the NRO taking to increase the use of commercial imagery, uh, remote sensing, to complement and integrate and uh, augment with government systems? Uh, I guess we'll break that into two pieces. Second piece is we're working closely with the NGA and the rest of the department to fully integrate um, commercial uh, services into the an integrated architecture so you can task them just as effectively as you can task any of the national systems. Uh, so working close, we've made great progress on that. Uh, with respect to incorporating new and additional commercial partners, that's that's been a, a big focus of ours. Um, obviously, we have a large number of uh, contracts with uh, electro-optical commercial providers. Uh, we also have contracts with uh, radar providers and commercial radar, commercial radar providers. And we have a, a set investment every year that its sole purpose is to accelerate and work with up and coming commercial partners to advance their capability uh, and help guide them on what the, the IC and DOT need so that as they make their investments, we can eventually form more uh, robust partnerships than other than just the, the early development phases. So we're doing it across the board. Very good, thank you. And finally, Dr. Cavelli, uh, Mr. Cavelli, DOD's commercial space strategy notes the importance of achieving integration with commercial entities prior to conflict to include planning and training activities. How would you characterize Space Force's current level of integration with commercial entities? I think today the best example of that would be launch. We're relying predominantly on the commercial launch infrastructure for launching our or most stressful missions as well as, uh, as ones that are uh, less stressful, you know, uh, like or more proliferated kind of systems. 
We're also using commercial today in some cases for, for satellite communication systems. And, uh, and I can envision a future where we use taking advantage more commercial to do things like more space domain awareness. And as it evolves and becomes more mature, sort of the space access, mobility, logistics, on-orbit servicing sort of things as well. So I think today, you know, we, we practice even just the standpoint of like the Victus Knox demo where we actually had a commercial flight that actually got our satellite up to orbit within about 27 hours from call up. And I think as we continue to evolve and take more advantage of the commercial sector, you're absolutely right. We need to include that as part of our training regimen as well. Very good. Thank you so much. I'll now turn to the ranking member for any questions he might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on this Title 10 versus Title 50 concern that the Chairman and I both raised. Uh, quick story, the Space Force and Indopaycom recently worked with our industry partners to notify warfighters of a CCP space launch within 24 hours and then use commercial imaging capability to image that same satellite within days, all unclassified. This information was immediately useful to the commander of Indopaycom, yet they faced opposition in even doing this exercise, and we hear consistently that the IC is opposed to DOD acquiring commercial imagery direct directly. Dr. Plum, um, as, as we've heard, there's an outdated DOD guidance surrounding this issue that was written in the early 2000s. Do you believe that we should take a look at that policy and update it to reflect a new reality? Yes. <laughs> Might you elaborate? Look, I think, uh, appreciate the question. and. I I just want to be clear. I, I truly do believe that despite what you're hearing, uh, we all agree that we need to find a way to make sure that the warfighter gets the information they need in an operational relevant timeline. Without that, I, there's no point in the systems. Like, that's, that's our mission. Uh, I do think what we found in the classification review is that these policies are very old. Uh, the classification policy was written before any of the commercial space had really evolved. Uh, what you're referring to here, I mean, there's an NSPD, a, a presidential document from 2003. Uh, there are other things, some classified, some not. But some of these are legacy, and, and legacy isn't as long anymore because the commercial uh, innovation has accelerated what's happening in the space domain so quickly. So I think it would be incorrect to not go back and look and say, hey, are these things, have, have, the, have the memos and policies evolved with the real situation? I mean, there was a time when commercial imagery just as an example, was the thing that people were like, this is so interesting. Well, now what the product is in the market is not just the imagery, it's also the analysis of it. And so that is a different place than we were 20 years ago. I think these need to be looked at. Okay, all right. Um Dr. Plum, as I said in my opening statement, I believe we've made profound progress in space uh, over the course of, of your tenure. Uh, I'm rather disappointed that you weren't uh, at the hearing yesterday to enjoy my esoteric uh, jokes that um, as a physics major, fellow physics major, I think you would have appreciated. It would have literally doubled the number of people laughing in the room. I would understand why people don't find jokes about hypersonics and Chernobyl so enjoyable, but in any event, um, I was wondering if you could just take a minute to reflect on your tenure um, and, and think about what are some of the, your most proud achievements? What are some of the most uh, significant areas where we've been able to make progress, or where you've uh, been well, able to make progress? First of all, thank you for that open-ended question. I, you know, the four C's that I, you know, we started with three C's from the day I got here, and then we ended up with four, because commercial is so important that we had to add that really to my priority list. I think we've made a lot of progress on all of those, but fundamentally the thing that I think has driven this is trying to be truly collaborative across the national security enterprise with the IC, with the services, with the White House, with the State Department, with the Congress as well, uh, and also the bipartisan approach here. I think in the past, folks have used classification to keep people out of decisions, and that tends to backfire. Uh, so I feel like having that collaborative approach has brought folks along together, and we've been able to iron out things early and, and really make progress. A focus on China has helped us make progress as well, sir. Uh, Nothing like having something to really focus the mind to say we need to get we need to get ready. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing going forward. Tremendous amount still to do for implementation, uh, and I would just say conflict's not inevitable. I've said this many times, but it's not inevitable. If we do our job right, it will not happen. Right? Deterrence yep. is the goal, uh, but we do have to be ready. Well, thank you again for your service, uh, Ms. Cavelli. Uh, the NDA 2018 NDAA. Uh, gave authorities to the Commander of Space Systems Command to maintain a watch list of contractors with a history of poor performance on space contracts. I'm just curious, how useful has this been? Is it a tool that we could expand? 
It's been, it's been useful. I think it can be more useful. I would love to see the tool expanded and, and, and given the authority to me as the service acquisition executive to be able to use the crawl across all the space acquisition enterprise that are under, underneath my, uh, my, my control. Right now, today, it's only at SSC and under the control of the SSC commander. Are there other authorities like that that would help you uh, better, uh, better maintain control over these contracts? I think that's a key one to get, and I think starting with that would be ideal. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Dr. Plum, I too want to join the chorus of those who thank you for your public service and certainly wish you well. I'm certain that we'll be seeing you in other capacities, and uh, we all look forward to that. Uh, Dr. Plum, on page four of your written testimony, it states, uh, Russia is also developing a concerning anti-satellite capability related to a new satellite carrying a nuclear device that Russia is developing. <clears throat> this capacity could pose a threat to all satellites operated by countries and companies around the globe, as well as the vital communication, scientific, meteorological, agriculture, commercial and national security services we all depend upon. Dr. Plum, this is the first time that the administration has approved anyone in an open, unclassified session making that statement. Just yesterday, Secretary Austin was asked this question, and he deferred and requested that he, the conversation only occur in a classified setting. So this is significant that you have made this statement. I'm assuming the White House has approved your statement today. Uh, Congressman, the, the, the statement, uh, I would say the National Security Advisor has made similar comments in the last few days, and it's on the, I believe it's on the WhitehouseGov website, but he has made them, and we can get those to you as well. But in a congressional, open, the first unclassified congressional statement, this yes, is the first time that anyone has made I think that's right, sir, and I, I do think that rightly falls to me, but yes, sir. Well, well, thank you for making it, because you both characterize the issue and the threat as, as, uh, as incredibly significant. I want to talk to you a little bit about the issue of developing. Um, you say that they are developing a concerning anti-satellite capability. Um, the, um, you first off acknowledge it's a satellite, so this is something that's going to be in orbit. Uh, will this be in low Earth orbit, geo orbit? Where is this intended that it would be located? Yeah, sir, a lot of this gets classified based on intel sources. Um, so at the moment, uh, I think that's as far as I can say, but right, the, the, the concept that we are concerned about is Russia developing, and uh, if we are unable to convince them otherwise to ultimately fly a nuclear weapon in space, which would be an indiscriminate weapon, doesn't have national boundaries, doesn't determine between military satellites, civilian satellites, or commercial satellites. So, Dr. Plum, you say developing. Is this conceptual, something that they put on a napkin somewhere? Is this they've developed a warhead? They've developed a satellite, they've married them together. Um, when you say develop, what is the, the current risk or threat? Is this something that could be launched? Let's start with this. Is this something that could be launched now? Um, and here's where you have me, again, at a disadvantage. I'd be happy to have this conversation, a classified session. If we don't have one after today, as I know you're constrained for votes, I'd be happy to come back in my remaining uh, tenure and, and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, sir. Is it an imminent threat? It is not imminent in the way that we should have it's to worry about it right now, but we are concerned about it. The department and the entire administration, and I know this Congress is taking this deadly seriously, and we are, you know, as you know, we just had that uh, United Nations Security Council resolution that Russia vetoed, uh, which may in fact tip their hand on this, uh, that really just reaffirmed not placing nuclear weapons in outer space, which Russia and the United States and all spacefaring nations have already signed up not to do. So this is a concern for us. Um, Dr. Plum, let's go to um, then what the effects would be. Sure. Uh, the secretary testified that it would be devastating. Uh, you list a, a, a you know, scientific, meteorological, agricultural, commercial, national security. Tell us some of the things um, that would be the outcome if this anti-satellite that carries a nuclear payload was used in orbit. Uh, yes, sir. First of all, you know, just to be clear, modeling on this needs to be conducted. You have to know the specifics of how a thing would be used, what type of a detonation it might be, where it might be detonated changes the outcome uh, as well. And some of this modeling uh, probably could be more robust. Uh, but roughly, uh, and low Earth orbit in particular, but roughly uh, satellites that aren't hardened against a nuclear detonation in space, which is most satellites, 
uh, could be damaged and affected, and some would be caught in an immediate blast, uh, which you know they would not be able to survive the flux of that. Uh, and then others could be damaged uh, over time by going through, uh, there's a dip in the Van Allen belts over the South Atlantic, and if those Van Allen belts are pumped, then radiation damage to satellites would just naturally occur over time. Dr. Plum, my time is exp expiring. I'm sorry, sir. It, yeah, could okay. this render the area of, of the uh, detonation uh, unusable for a period of time? So, uh, several analysts do believe that uh, detonation in space of the right magnitude in the right location could render low Earth orbit, for example, uh, unusable for some period of time. And this was an example that we did uh, in the 60s. You know, the Mr. United Chairman, States. If you might, uh, if you, can you can you give us some perspective? You said for a period of time. I, I, I will just doesn't. well again. I I don't have those numbers for me. I would just say in uh, in the 60s, the United States uh, detonated a nuclear weapon in space, right. uh, unclassified Starfish Prime, and that uh, really rendered the orbits unusable for some. Could period. it be a year? I believe it could, yes, sir. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Nor Mr. Kurbahal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Garamendi, for your generously yielding to me. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Plum, for your many service, many years of service to our country. And I wish you the best in whatever you pursue next. Certainly, I hope it's staying in touch with the federal government in some way or another. Innovation and competition from the commercial industry have lowered the cost of space launch for the U.S. government and private industry by a factor of four, saving the DOD tens of billions. In my district at Vandenberg Space Force Base, I have seen how decreased costs for space access drives investment and innovation that greatly increases our nation's launch capacity. Vandenberg had only four launches in 2012, but may have as many as 50 this year alone, a significant development for the department and the U.S. industrial base. Mr. Cavalli, can you discuss how lower launch costs brought by commercial innovation and competition in the national security space launch program have changed our national security posture, including enabling the deployment of proliferated resilient constellations, a significant national security capability that was only feasible a decade ago from a launch cost or, or capacity perspective that wasn't feasible. I tell you, sir, um, lowering, the lower cost of launch has been a game changer for us all. It has dramatically improved our ability to build smaller satellites, to launch them quicker, to build proliferated constellations, it has really become sort of an, an amazing enabler for not only national security's launch, but also for what we're seeing is a, is a proliferation of commercial space companies now. We're seeing companies being able to actually launch cost-effective satellites, so we're seeing universities building satellites and CubeSats, we're seeing a whole generation of, 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 of young folks starting companies to go off and do servicing on, in space and to do uh, space missions, um, people looking at building you know, commercial habitats in space. It's, it's amazing, but a lot, all this is driven and enabled by the lower cost of launch. Thank you. Proliferated LEO constellations have made services available that used to require very expensive, exquisite, oftentimes large satellites. Our domestic Earth observation industry can provide imagery faster and cheaper than ever before, which is why I am supportive of the Space Force Tactical Surveillance, Reconnaissance, and Tracking Program. This capability provides tremendous benefit to our combatant commands who have asked for this ability. Mr. Covelli, can you walk me through how the recent demo conducted by the Space Force and Indo-PACOM demonstrates how valuable this capability could be to the Department of Defense? Yeah, so we're off doing a pilot program right now at a Space Systems Command, and it's going extremely well. And there's, we're just very fortunate that the commercial industry has taken off in terms of commercial analytics that use space sensing as well as a variety of other sources to, to gather information and be able to do rudimentary things that we're able to provide to the commands in a timely manner. So we've invested some dollars in it last year. We've got some dollars heading in next year as well, and we continue on with the pilot and look forward to reporting back how that pilot goes. Thank you. Some argue against the Space Force moving forward 
with this program at scale because there could be duplication with the IC on what is being bought from the industry that the government could be paying for the same data twice. Mr. Cavalli, do you believe that concern, that concern could be overcome by the appropriate policies and structure guided by recent commercial space strategies? It could be done in policy and structure, but I will tell you that I've, I've asked my folks at the working level and they say that they've enjoyed and they work cooperatively with the NRO and with the NGA to make sure there is no duplication going on. So across the working level, the teams are actually doing great and making sure we don't have any duplication. So I'm very proud of the intelligence community and the Department of Defense for working together on this. Thank you. Mr. Plum, China and Russia are investing in their space programs and making advancements. Do you think that fiscal year 25 budget request for our national security space program is adequate to maintain space superiority? And what happens if we fall behind in our space capabilities? Well, I mean, sir, first of all, I do think it's adequate. I think obviously anyone in the department would always prefer to have additional money to put against additional problem sets. Uh, and the Fiscal uh, Restraint Act, uh, Responsibility Act, uh, does put some budget pressure on us as we look at this. The one thing I'll say is when you look at the Space Force, if we're looking at what can you do in the next two years to get ready for a, you know, a potential Taiwan problem set, that really has some problems for the Space Force in particular uh, as kind of a new service. It sort of eats seed corn if you can't also think about the 2030s, and that's a trade-off. We wrestle with every budget, but I think the Space Force may be more impacted than others. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Desjardins. Thank you. Mr. Cavelli, the Phase Three acquisition strategy for the National Security Space Launch Program allows the Space Force to select up to three providers for its Lane 2 missions. As I'm sure you're aware, there's been some talk in the media about consolidation in the launch sector. Uh, if it ultimately comes to fruition, how would this consolidation impact your acquisition strategy for Phase 3? So the Phase 3 Act strategy won't change. The Phase 3 Act strategy proposals are in-house and we're working through them right now. So that's pretty much set in stone. I really like the Phase 3 strategy. If, if you think about our history, we were under a monopoly in terms of a single company for launch for, for decades. And the Air Force and now the Space Force, to their credit, have done a magnificent job of cultivating a second provider. And I think as a nation, the only, the, one of the best things we possibly could do is, is cultivate a third provider as well to launch our most stressful missions. On top of that, the lane one is some more commercial-like missions where we're allowing anybody to on-ramp onto that who brings a rocket and that has demonstrated a test of a flight. And so um, I'm very optimistic with the strategy that we put together. I don't see that changing. Mergers and acquisition happens all the time in industry. We'll see what happens over time. And if any consolidation occurs, we'll have to adjust it then. Okay. Uh, one concern is that we're trying to chart out this strategy for the next 10 years, and with China increasing its launch cadence every year, it's imperative that we get it right. Can you confidently project a 10-year strategy to deter China? So it's really a, the launch strategy is really a five-year strategy, right? Lane two is a five-year strategy. Lane one is a five-year strategy with, with five one-year options. And so we always have the opportunity to adjust the contract at any point in time. Okay. I'm curious to know if you're planning on maintaining block buys in future procurements. Uh, certainly this would help maintain healthy supply chains here in the U.S., but I'm interested in understanding how you all are assessing this idea. Yeah, the, uh, the, we, the team does a really great job in terms of looking out into the future and understanding and doing the, the, what they call their mission allocation process. And so um, we end up doing you know, block buys as part of phase two, and I don't see that changing as part of lane two for phase three. Okay. Well, staying on the issue of how we can best leverage the ever-evolving space industry, and Dr. Plum, I, I would like to get you in here in addition to uh, Secretary Calvelli. Again, I think the department is largely doing a great job leveraging innovation in the private industry to meet national security objectives in the space domain. However, a key hindrance to this effort has been the cumbersome FAA permitting process for launch and re-entry licenses. How are you working with the FAA and the industry to improve efficiency in the review and approval process? Uh, thanks, sir. I, I would say that the department does need the FAA to move, uh, you know, sometimes more quickly. I do think they have some funding challenges. I've recently been involved personally in some conversations with them. I think the department generally supports efforts to help the FAA be able to uh, have enough resources to get this right. Anything to add? 
Uh, just like we'd mentioned earlier about, you know, it's always great to look at policies and, and, and directives and update them. I, I am sure that, uh, you know, the current regulations that were put in place didn't anticipate what an amazing space enterprise we were going to have and space economy for the country. And I think that uh, both Congress and the executive branch need to work together to make sure that we have the most efficient and effective uh, regulations and policies in place to continue to allow commercial industry to innovate and take advantage of launch and take advantage of space as opposed to being held back. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank all the witnesses for being here today, and certainly, uh, Dr. Plum, we appreciate everything you've done, and uh, more importantly, what you will continue to do. Uh, I'm going to drill down a little bit further on the conversation that uh, Mr. Turner started, and the conversation we have when we start talking about the recent UN uh, security resolution that was uh, vetoed by Russia. Uh, but you mentioned an item and brings it up, the Outer Space Treaty, early 60s sometimes, or maybe it was the late 60s signed on to, that talks about uh, weaponization in space. More specifically, I think it talked about mass destruction. Could you brief us quickly on that? Yes, sir. Uh, it's it's pretty straightforward, actually, at least for satellites in orbit around the, the Earth. It basically says that countries agree not to place uh, nuclear weapons or any other weapons of mass destruction in orbit around the Earth. And so the fact that Russia uh, vetoed a resolution reaffirming a commitment they've already made and, uh, is, is concerning. The reason I bring that up is the term mass destruction. Uh, because when we look at what is going on, outside of what was recently reported, have the Russian and Chinese always, have they already militarized and weaponized space? So, uh, if, if I may, I think you're asking, uh, what you're asking is a slightly uh, different question. Exactly. Because the Outer Space Treaty uh, does not uh, preclude uh, military weapons in space. It precludes weapons of mass destruction in space, and it specifically calls out nuclear weapons just to uh, eliminate any uh, uh, confusion. But if the question is, are Russia and China weaponizing space or militarizing space? Absolutely. A absolutely. Uh, they are developing and fielding and deploying a number of counter space weapons. Some are ground based, uh, but some are on orbit. And I think that personally, personally think that that is what makes their uh, kind of continuing championing at the UN, their PPWT, which is about not placing weapons on orbit, to be so hypocritical and frankly unbelievable. Uh, you know, I, I, at the unclassified level, we can say that Russia is deploying and developing uh, prototype uh, kinetic weapons in space. We can say that China has developed uh, robotic satellites that are really probably dual use. They could be used for non-military military purposes, but they can clearly also be used for military purposes like grappling a satellite. Uh, and in classified sessions, to go deeper. But I do think that their proposal to the UN just continues to be both unbelievable, unverifiable, and, and really hypocritical based on what they're actually doing. Exactly the point we're trying to make. There are weapons in space, mass destruction, crossing over that threshold, particularly with the, the nuclear side of that equation. Uh, when we look forward to what is coming in space, and quite frankly, uh, potentially could happen, our nuclear command and control, and it will be delicate in this environment, uh, in the event that space were to be blocked, mass destruction somewhere else, what would cause us in concerns for nuclear command and control? Space got wiped out. We still have a way of addressing those issues. So uh, I'll just say any good military plan requires both your primary, your alternate, your contingency, your emergency plan for communications. Uh, we do rely heavily on space for our military missions, uh, but we do need to have uh, uh, plans for uh, contingency. Right. But as we look forward, and this is where I'm going with this line of questioning, uh, in addition to the command and control, putting that aside, could be addressed, our eyes would be put out. Yes, sir. And that is a major concern because then we won't necessarily know until some other form would let us know that there was an attack 
Yeah, I think uh, this is where, this, this line of conversation is the type of conversation that needs to be held with potential adversaries, right, with Russia, with China. Right, this is why we have routinely said that attacks on a nuclear command and control system, including our overhead eyes, that you know, overhead persistent infrared, is uh, is a prelude to attack. This is a concern, right? If you're doing this, why are you doing this outside of being ready to attack us and blind us? And so these are there should be off limits things to prevent escalation uh, in the worst case to a nuclear war. Exactly my point. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Strong. Thank you, Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Moulton. Uh, Mr. Galvelli, thank you for being here today. Um, you may have heard a few weeks ago I co-led a bipartisan letter in support of the National Security Space Launch Program with Ranking Member Moulton, uh, which supported uh, several members, which is supported by several members of the House Defense Committee. I'd like to commend the department for its steps taken to encourage competition within phase three of the NSSL program, specifically the dual lane approach, which provides separate launch opportunities for new entrants and experienced national security launch providers. However, I do have concerns about lane one. What guardrails does phase three have to keep any providers, particularly our experienced providers with high launch cadences from uh, underbidding lane one launches intended for the new entrants trying to cut their teeth? You know, it's all gonna depend on, uh, on what the payload is and the mission. And uh, I mean, the key to entry into lane one is the ability to actually have launched the rocket. The, um, I, I, understand, I think I understand your point and I'd like to take that back to think more through about that. Thank you. Uh, to be clear, uh, there's nothing official within the phase three strategy to ensure that uh, smaller new providers uh, are benefiting from lane one as intended. Is that, is that a fair assessment? I think it all depends on the size of the, of the payload. If, if you're launching you know, just a couple of small sets, it's gonna be more cost effective to go on a, a small provider than it is gonna be on more of a traditional rocket. It's just, it's gonna cost you a lot less. I understand the point you're trying to make, but if the department is truly committed to the dual lane approach and encouraging new providers to work with the Space Force, I would personally like to see something a bit more uh, concrete to, to protect this. Uh, Mr. Cavalletti, how confident are you that the Space Force's plan uh, for missile warning and tracking capabilities meets requirements to provide full operational capability within the necessary time frame? Well, I'm, I'm very confident we've got a, a great Architects are already on orbit today with the space-based infrared system, so we're flying vehicles with that today. Those are operational on orbit and doing great things. We have their replacements coming through what's called the next-gen GEO program that is uh, continuing to make progress, and we'll see a launch of that in 25-26 timeframe. We have some challenges making sure that the mission payload gets delivered. It's about a year late, and we're tracking that really closely. It should arrive this summer for integration into the satellite and for a launch at the end of 25, early 26. On top of that, we also have pivoted a couple years back to start developing a proliferated LEO constellation and a proliferated MEO constellation at medium Earth orbit. Both those constellations added new capability. The ones on orbit say only do missile warning. These are now, these systems at MEO and LEO will do missile tracking. So they'll warn you and they'll track the missile which would be ideal for advanced weapon systems like hypersonics. That's exactly why I uh, you know, asked that question. I know you submitted a statement. Uh, you highlighted a concern with the delivery of the timeline for the next generation uh, GEO, and I appreciate that, that answer. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, and I see there are uh, five minutes left on the clock over on the voting on the chamber, but I'm gonna let Garamendi, Mr. Garamendi, is ask any questions he wants to. Mr. Norcross and I just developed an additional question. Was the 1960 nuclear explosion by the United States information classified? No, you can, you can look it up online, sir. What did we learn from that? Well, obviously it was a different uh, time, and of course we were doing nuclear tests to learn things, but I think what we learned, uh, if I have my history right, is that it uh, did significant damage to all the satellites that were in those orbits, uh, and some failed soon, but some failed over time and was attributed to that explosion. Th thank you. Uh, I'm going to just pose the question, then come back to you in writing, because we are out of time here. And this is for uh, Dr. Plum and Mr. Cavalli. Um, Commander of U.S. Space Command cited space domain awareness as the command's top priority among the escalating 
threats from China and Russia, part of what was discussed just a moment ago. Um, do we have the ability to be aware? And if not, what do we need to do to be aware of the space? Uh, if you can come back to us in writing, other than that, our careers will be terminated if we miss a vote. So we'd best be on our way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for testifying. I thank the members for participating. I thank the audience for their interest. And we are now adjourned. No question. I just had to ask that question. <laughs> Absolutely.